Okay, we might have some more people trickle in, but we can go ahead and get started now for the sake of time. So again, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I am really looking forward to this panel. My name is Jeff Sebo, and I direct the Mind Ethics and Policy Program at NYU. This is a program that examines non-human consciousness and sentience and sapience and moral and legal and political status with special emphasis on animals like insects and artificial intelligences uh, through a combination of research and outreach of various kinds. And as part of that, we are very excited to be hosting Susan Schneider and Jonathan Birch for this panel discussion on investigating non-human consciousness. And, and so in particular, Jonathan Birch is going to talk about investigating non-human consciousness in the case of arthropods like insects. And Susan Schneider will then discuss investigating non-human consciousness in the case of artificial intelligences. And then we can all have a discussion about each of their frameworks for investigating non-human consciousness and whether we should be taking similar or different approaches for these different non-human populations. And, and hopefully we can all make some progress together. Uh, so I will introduce the speakers in a moment, but first I want to uh, thank a few people. Uh, in particular, I wanna thank Sophia Davis Fogel, the program coordinator for the Mind Ethics and Policy Program for putting this event together. Thank you very much, Sophia, and, and for running it right now. I also want to thank our co-sponsors for their generous support of this event. And that includes the NYU Center for Mind, Brain, and Consciousness, the NYU Animal Studies Initiative, and the NYU Center for Bioethics. So thank you very much to our partners for, for working with us on this event. Uh, and I will also note what the format will be. Uh, as I said a moment ago, uh, Jonathan will start and give a short talk, and then Susan will give a short talk. I can then ask them some questions, and then I can start relaying questions from the audience to the speakers. So all along the way, if you have any questions or comments or objections or any intervention at all, please feel free to enter that in the Q&A tab on Zoom. And please also feel free to upvote uh, questions or comments or objections written by other people. And when we get to the discussion portion of the event, I can then read some of your comments uh, to, to the speakers and, and we can have a conversation that way. Okay, now with all of that out of the way, let me introduce our speakers, starting with Susan Schneider, who is the William F. Dietrich Distinguished Professor of Philosophy of Mind, founding director of the Center for the Future Mind, and co-director of the Machine Perception and Cognitive Robotics Lab at Florida Atlantic University. Schneider previously held the NASA chair at NASA and the Distinguished Scholar Chair at the Library of Congress. She also appears frequently on television shows on stations such as PBS and the History Channel, and she writes opinion pieces for the New York Times, Scientific American, and the Financial Times. Her recent book, Artificial You, AI, and the Future of the Mind, discusses the philosophical implications of artificial intelligence. And Jonathan Birch is an associate professor of philosophy at the LSE and principal investigator on the Foundations of Animal Sentience Project. In 2021, he led a review of the evidence of sentience in cephalopod mollusks and decapod crustaceans that led to invertebrate animals, including octopuses, crabs, and lobsters, being included in the UK government's Animal Welfare Act of 2022. In addition to his interest in animal sentience, cognition, and welfare, Birch has also has a longstanding interest in the evolution of altruism and social behavior. His first book, The Philosophy of Social Evolution, was published by Oxford University Press in 2017. So, so welcome to the two of you, and thank you so much for being here. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. And with uh, all of that said, I will now turn it over to uh, Jonathan to kick us off with a discussion about investigating consciousness in invertebrates. So Jonathan, whenever you are ready, feel free to take it away. Well, thanks very much, Jeff. Thanks for that very generous introduction. Thanks for uh, organizing this event. And of course, thanks as well to Sophia for all of her work behind the scenes in, in organizing this event as well. And also thanks to everyone who's attending because it's great to see a number of attendees in the, in the triple figures. Fantastic. I mean, I think that speaks to the the compelling event that, that Jeff has put together, thinking of questions of animal consciousness and AI consciousness at the same time. I think it's a wonderful pair of problems because in the animal case, we're faced with this problem of 
how on earth to study consciousness in systems that cannot give us any verbal evidence, that cannot, cannot tell us how they're feeling, which is such an important source of evidence in the human case. In the AI case, we're faced with this overwhelming abundance of verbal evidence, too much verbal evidence, most of it completely misleading. And so I think it's fascinating to compare and contrast the two problems. Now, I've been thinking mostly over recent years about questions of animal consciousness. I'm the principal investigator on a project called the Foundations of Animal Sentience Project, funded by the, the ERC. I think you know the motivation for this project goes back 10 years, really, to this moment in 2012, where a group of eminent consciousness scientists got together in Cambridge and tried to create this moment that they called the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness, where they said non-human animals, including all mammals and birds and many other creatures, including octopuses, possess neuro neurological substrates complex enough to support conscious experiences. They were trying to create a shift. They were trying to say, let's stop debating whether any animals are conscious. Let's have a consensus that some animals are conscious, particularly the mammals and the birds. And let's have a science of animal consciousness dedicated to trying to find out what we can about those conscious experiences modeled on a science of human consciousness. Now, 10 years later, I think a field really is emerging, a field of animal sentience or animal consciousness research, a strongly interdisciplinary field that draws on expertise from evolutionary biology. Think of people like Eva Jablonka, for example, animal welfare science and veterinary science, cognitive and effective neuroscience, Comparative psychology, think of people like Lars Chitka, Nikki Clayton, and also my own discipline of philosophy. A community starting to get together around a shared research agenda and shared questions with its own journal, the journal Animal Sentience, founded by Stephen Harnad in 2016. But this emerging field faces foundational challenges, this challenge of working out what the relevant sources of evidence are given that no animal is ever just going to tell us what it's feeling, leads to a lot of disputes, particularly about hard cases, not mammals and birds, but cases where there is serious ongoing dispute about whether there is any conscious experience there at all, about whether there's anything it's like to be one of these animals. For some people, that, uh, that dispute starts with any invertebrates at all, even octopuses, squid, cuttlefish, Many are now quite persuaded by the evidence in those animals, but then your attention naturally turns to arthropods like decapod crustaceans, crabs, lobsters, shrimps, to insects like bees, which are a major focus of, of my project, but also not just to arthropods, but to other invertebrates as well. You start to wonder how widely spread in the animal kingdom could subjective experience be? Could there be something something it's like to be a nematode worm with fewer than 400 neurons. Could there be something it's like to be a horseshoe crab? These are, uh, they're, they're, not, they're not decapods, but they're extremely important in vaccine manufacture. They have to be drained of their blood because of its coagulant properties. So a lot of debate about whether there should be limits on what we can do to horseshoe crabs. And you might even wonder, you start to th wonder about necessary conditions, right? And you start to think, is a central nervous system really necessary for any subjective experience? What about animals like jellyfish? There's enormous uncertainty around these cases, and I think we shouldn't pretend to have conclusive answers, certainty, anything like that. My project is about trying to make some progress on these questions of how we can move, move these disputes forward scientifically. Uh, it's been an absolute delight over, over the last um, two and a half years to assemble this team. You can go to our website if you want to learn more. By the way, if you want to bring up any of these slides um, on your own screen later, just remember the link bit.ly slash birchnyu. I know the slides can sometimes go past rather quickly, and you may want to revisit them. Click, click some of the links. Just go to bit.ly slash birchnyu, and you can find out more about our project that way. We, we also have... Um, Joe Ledoux visiting us this year, who's in that picture and is, of course, well known around uh, around NYU parts. So we've been working on a lot. It's a decent sized team. And we've been thinking about various questions where we think progress might be possible. We've been asking, how can we look for evidence of conscious experience 
given our uncertainty about its neural basis and uh, functional profile, I'll be coming back to that topic in a moment because it's our main one for today. We've also been asking other questions. So if you think about those mammals and birds where people tend to agree that there is some conscious experience there, you face a question about variation. How can we make sense of variation in properties of conscious states, given that, well, in my opinion, as, as we've argued in this paper called Dimensions of Animal Consciousness, it does not make a great deal of sense to describe one animal as more conscious than another, or to attempt to rank them along a single sliding scale, where perhaps an octopus might be more conscious than a bee, a bird might be more conscious than an octopus. We argue against that in favor of a multi-dimensional framework for thinking about variation, where animals that are conscious, they vary along many relevant dimensions. And for particular purposes, we may want to construct multi-dimensional profiles for trying to locate them in that space of variation along relevant dimensions. And we've also been thinking about a more pragmatic question. How should policymakers respond now to a complicated evidential picture given very significant uncertainty. And I've long advocated for, in some sense, applying the precautionary principle in this area, giving animals the benefit of the doubt when we're not sure, erring on the side of caution. In short, you know, don't drop them in boiling water when there's more humane ways you could be killing them. My team was commissioned to write the review Jeff mentioned uh, for the UK government last year comprehensive review of all the evidence we think exists currently that is relevant to questions of sentience in cephalopods and decapods. We ended up recommending in that report that the UK government should include cephalopods and decapods in the scope of animal welfare law. And to some extent it has. You know, the government amended its, its draft animal welfare sentience bill to expand its scope beyond vertebrates to include cephalopods and decapods as well. We see that as a first step and you know, we hope it will lead to more substantial on the ground frontline steps to protect the welfare of these animals, but it's a start. For today, I mean, if you want an overview of all of these themes, uh, you can look to Philosophy Compass and the article we, we published called Animal Sentience there. But I want to zoom in on this question now about evidence and what the sort of high quality evidence is we can look for in this area and what makes it good. Uh, given our great uncertainty, for my purposes, when I talk about consciousness, I mean, there's various different things people might mean by, by consciousness. I'm referring to what philosophers like to call phenomenal consciousness, conscious experience, the sense of consciousness associated with the hard problem of consciousness, you know, an idea very closely associated with NYU, of course. And a state is phenomenally conscious when there's something it's like to be in that state be great if we could give a more um, specific definition than that of phenomenal consciousness, but it's something that notoriously eludes a definition in functional terms. It's hard to do better, in fact, than just there's something it's like to be smelling coffee, something it's like to be looking at a blue sky, to be feeling pain or pleasure. And from our own conscious experiences with which we're so intimately familiar, we can abstract that general idea of a state such that there's something it's like to be in it. And this is what we're thinking about in animals. When I'm talking about whole animals, I'll say an animal is conscious or sentient if it's capable of being in such a state, a state such that there's something it's like for it to be in it. Sentience is sometimes used in a narrower sense to refer specifically to experiences with a positive or negative quality like pain or pleasure. In this talk, I'll just use it in, in a broad sense to refer to the capacity for phenomenal consciousness. Now in my writing on this, and particularly in this paper uh, in Noose this year called The Search for Invertebrate Consciousness, I've contrasted three ways we might try to study consciousness in non-human systems such as invertebrates that I call theory heavy, theory neutral, and theory light. I criticize the first two in order to try and defend this middle path that I call the theory light path. So let's think about these, these options then. Um, now, in the theory heavy, take theories from human consciousness science off the shelf and apply them to the present case. For example, you might take uh, global workspace theory off the shelf, integrated information theory. 
The strategy faces huge problems, I think. I mean, there's huge disagreement about the correct theory in the human case to begin with. But also, I think it's worse than that. There's also many ways to extrapolate a theory designed for the human case to other cases. And the human evidence seems to underdetermine the correct extrapolation. This can be illustrated with the example of global workspace theory. That in broad outline, this is a theory that says in humans, information is consciously experienced when it enters the global workspace, a mechanism that integrates content from many different sources and broadcasts that integrated content back to the uh, input systems and onward to a wide range of consumer systems. An idea captured in this famous figure from uh, Stan Dehaan and colleagues in the 1990s. Consciousness is this mechanism where everything comes together, where the brain gets on the same page. You could imagine very simple versions of this and very complicated versions of it. The problem when we think about animals is that clearly no non-human animal will possess the whole human global broadcast network. Peter Carruthers has argued for this persuasively, that the input systems and consumer systems will vary across species. Not all of these little processes will all be there in every case, of course. And the neuronal implementation will vary too. In mammals, it seems to be very closely linked to the prefrontal cortex. It definitely won't be if, the, if there's such a mechanism there in fish or bees or octopuses because they don't have a prefrontal cortex. It leads to the question of which parts of the human global broadcast network are indispensable for generating conscious experience. You can imagine many different versions of the theory each taking different views on this question. And the human evidence just can't tell between these versions. But you know, seeing those problems with the theory heavy approach, I think leads one naturally to the thought that what if we could just proceed in a theory free way, a theory neutral way? What if we could just look for behavior in animals that in us would be caused by conscious experiences and then use theory free arguments from analogy to draw inferences? In us, this behavior would be caused by a conscious experience, so let's infer it is in the animal too. But here you get a different kind of problem, a problem of credulousness. That this approach le leads to a credulous attitude without a solid theory of what counts as a relevant behavioral similarity and what can defeat inferences from behavior. This problem can be illustrated by thinking about the case of Paramecia and Matthias Michel, Yet another NYU person uh, in this talk has, has argued in a 2019 paper that, you know, think about paramecium. There are defensive behaviors in paramecium. If a paramecium encounters a potentially dangerous salt solution or acetic acid, it will back away and swim in a different direction or engage in defensive behavior by discharging trichocysts. It would, however, be quite credulous to infer from this that paramecium is, is feeling pain. It is after all, a unicellular organism with no nervous system, no neurons, no nerves. Intuitively, many people's reaction to this is you know, the fact that the paramecium is unicellular is some kind of defeater here. The absence of a nervous system is some kind of defeater for the inference to consciousness. But then you have to give a theory of why that is, and that's very difficult. Uh, why should it be the case that a theory of, um, you know, that a system without a nervous system cannot be conscious. Uh, if we think systems without prefrontal cortex can be conscious, why, sh why should lacking a nervous system be suddenly the, the crucial line? The immaturity of our theories of consciousness that bedevils theory-heavy approaches ends up bedeviling this approach as well, because we need a theory of defeaters and we don't have a good one. So these reflections led me in this recent paper to advocate for a kind of middle path that I hope avoids the problems of the two previous cases, where we organize inquiry using a hypothesis that is more general than any specific theory, and that can be a point of consensus across rival theories, but that nonetheless is rich enough to guide inquiry. This is what I call the facilitation hypothesis, the hypothesis that conscious perception of a stimulus facilitates relative to unconscious perception, a cluster of cognitive abilities in relation to that stimulus. The thought is that we don't just look for any and every behavior, but we should be looking specifically for cognitive abilities that are facilitated by conscious perception in humans. And then in animals, we should go and look for similar patterns of facilitation 
by a special kind of perceptual processing. And when we find a similar pattern of facilitation, that gives us some evidence that there is also a conceptual pathway animal, where the strength of evidence depends on the complexity and the similarity of the patterns of facilitation found. That's quite abstract, but it, I think you get some intuition on it by thinking of examples. I'll give an example um, from an animal very evolutionarily close to us, monkeys, and then I'll turn to a rather further away case. There was an excellent paper in 2021 by Shea Ben Hahn colleagues, a group based in Yale, looking for, looking in monkeys, ways of dissociating conscious and unconscious perception, relying on the idea that conscious perception in us facilitates the learning of incongruent cues. So an incongruent cue is where the cue relates to a target in a way that is sort of counterintuitive. Right? So you can imagine uh, the, the predictor appears over the right side of your visual field, and that predicts the target is about to appear in the left side of the visual field. Um, and then the, predi the prediction was that in humans, if the cue is perceived subliminally, if it's unconsciously perceived, all it will do is distract attention. Humans won't be able to learn the predictive relationship. By contrast, if the stimulus is presented consciously, if the human consciously experiences it, they will be able to learn the incongruent association. And so they will be able to learn where the target's gonna be. But then they tested the, the, the same hypothesis with the monkeys, where instead of verbal report, they used gaze tracking. So this is a creative example of how to get evidence that is report-like in a non-human animal. You track where they look. Are they looking where the target's gonna appear? or where it's not going to appear. And they found exactly the same dissociation. So they found that just as conscious perception facilitates the learning of incongruent cues in us, in the monkeys, there's this putatively conscious perceptual pathway that also facilitates the same learning ability. And of course, this is in monkeys, and we tend to agree that monkeys are conscious anyway. So it's sort of not that surprising, really. But what I want to draw attention to is the methodological strategy being pursued here, which I think is a really good one, and one that we don't have to only use in monkeys, but we can try and use in other animals as well. And there was another pretty impressive study from this year by Grover et al. in, in Nature that was using a similar kind of strategy, but this time in a very different candidate for consciousness, Drosophila. Flies with much, much smaller brains, about 100,000 neurons, I think. People have rarely asked questions of consciousness in relation to them. But what they were doing was they were drawing inspiration from human consciousness science and from a well-known um, facilitative relationship where it seems as though conscious perception facilitates our ability to learn about relations in time. So when a cue overlaps with an unconditioned stimulus, it seems like you can learn that relationship even if you, you don't consciously perceive the first cue, even if it's unconsciously perceived. But when there's a gap in time, so for example, a, a tone in your ear might be followed a second later by a puff of air in your eye. When there's that time gap, it really seems as though consciousness makes a difference. Conscious perception of the stimuli facilitates that learning. They found a strikingly similar pattern in Drosophila involving this remarkable setup where they have the fly inside a virtual reality arena. So there's this ball, they can project stimuli onto the inside of the ball. And um, basically the T the right way up predicts a aversive stimulus in the form of, um, I think a, a, a light, a laser is shined on them that triggers nociceptors. And then uh, the upside down T predicts no, no aversive reinforcement. And then they test their ability to learn that relationship between the predictive cue and the negative reinforcement. And they find you know, evidence of there being um, two different mechanisms. A mechanism that does the, the simpler kind of learning, the delay conditioning, and then another more sophisticated mechanism that does the learning about time, the trace conditioning. And they show that that second mechanism, just as in humans, is impaired by distraction, just as it would be in us, whereas the first mechanism just carries on regardless whether there's any distractors or not. 
Now, no one would look at this kind of thing and say, okay, that settles it then. That just shows Drosophila are conscious. And, and the authors claim no such thing, and I wouldn't claim such a thing either. But it's part of a picture. And one could imagine experiments like this building up a pretty convincing case over time. Um, if you start looking for many different abilities that in us are facilitated by conscious perception, and you find that same set of abilities is being facilitated by this sophisticated perceptual pathway in the fly, you really are starting to build up a case that gets more and more convincing as that pattern of facilitation gets richer and more similar. So this is what I mean by a, a theory light approach. You know, it's not totally disavowing all theory. Uh, it makes a substantive theoretical commitment to an explanatory facilitative relationship between consciousness and cognition. But that, that commitment can be a point of overlapping consensus across rival theories. I also think there's no reason why we should await conclusive evidence from the human case about what exactly conscious perception facilitates in us. There is disagreement about this. There's no total agreement on trace conditioning, for example, as one of the things that is facilitated. But there's no need to await the conclusive evidence before we start studying animals. The two sides of this program can proceed concurrently. The vision here is of a relationship between human consciousness science and animal consciousness science that is one of interdependence, not one-way dependence where the animal stuff has to wait until the human stuff has reached consensus. Interdependence, where human consciousness science studies what it is that conscious perception is doing for us, what it is facilitating. And animal consciousness researchers search for similar patterns of facilitation in other animals, including evolutionarily distant ones like insects. And then all of that can feed into theory construction, allowing us to build better theories than we have now of the kind of processing that is explaining these patterns of facilitation and that we have some reason to identify with conscious experience. So that's the overall vision. And that's why I'm kind of, I think of myself as an optimist about the science of animal consciousness. I think there are real problems, and I've emphasized in the first part of the talk, the real problems. But we can also see our way past these problems. We can see how through looking at cognitive abilities facilitated by conscious perception, we can build a wealth of relevant evidence that may well ultimately lead us to think that consciousness in insects is much more likely than we initially thought. So hopefully that's uh, enough to get us started. And thanks very much for your attention. Great, thank you so much, Jonathan. And uh, Susan, we can now go to you whenever you feel ready. Uh, Jonathan, if you can unshare yep. your slides and then Susan, you can uh, share your slides. Okay. Perfect. My slides? We had a lot of trouble earlier. <laughs> it works, we did it. Oh boy, okay, let's hope this sticks. All right, everybody, I'm going to try to go very quickly through this because we obviously have a lot to talk about. That was a really exciting uh, presentation. So just to remind people, here's the problem that I'm dealing with, with machine consciousness. Um, could the processing of an AI feel a certain way from the inside? It's different from the hard problem. By consciousness, I mean exactly what Jonathan said earlier, the felt quality of experience. I'll use it synonymously with sentience. As philosophers know, the word could, <laughs> you know, you can take a whole class in modal logic on that. Um, today, I won't be talking about conceptual possibility of conscious machines. You can read chapter two of my book. I think they're conscious, they're, conscious machines are conceptually possible. I'm not going to go into that. What I'm going to do today is talk about what we might see on Earth, um, because I think there are pressing ethical concerns here suggesting we should focus focus on whether we will be able to or even want to build conscious machines on Earth in the next several decades. And, you know, I want to see if we can think about some tests for machine consciousness. Now, before I start on my ideas about testing, I want to mention the pressing reasons that we should look for tests for machine consciousness. Um, it, you know, first off, wrongly denying that AI is conscious when it in fact is um, could lead to 
AI suffering and enslavement. This is the usual robo rights uh, issue that comes up a lot. But there are a lot of other things that people just don't consider. So for example, it would ruin AI development for big technology, it, for big tech, if this happened. So suppose uh, you work for Google and you're in charge of the next um, big natural language system, the, the next version of Lambda, I think it's called Palm now, these large language models. And you think your system isn't conscious, but it is. And you find out that you're wrong and the public knows about it. Well, it won't be possible to use your system for ethical reasons, potentially. Or you might be dealing with issues of system volatility, uh, for example, public outcry. So I think it is important that big tech think about these issues as well. Also, wrongly claiming that AI is conscious could lead to giving the same legal protections to beings that aren't sentient as we give to beings that are. Um, and also a very different issue, transhumanists often think that we can replace parts of the brain with microchips. Uh, for example, Elon Musk, Ray Kurzweil. I mean, I hear it all day when I go to Washington um, or even upload the brain, for example. And that we could survive doing this and that we could be conscious beings. But notice that if microchips are not the right stuff for consciousness, we wouldn't be able to do this. Um, we would lose consciousness and we wouldn't survive. Um, you know, survival seems to be tied to that. I mean, or at least we wouldn't survive the way we want to survive. Um, so if microchips aren't the right stuff, uh, a lot hangs on that. At best, when it comes to enhancing the brain with AI chips, neurotech can only replace parts of the brain that aren't responsible for consciousness. That's it. And that may limit brain chips as an AI safety strategy, uh, as a way to augment intelligence to follow the complex computations of superintelligence, for example. That's been one of the things Musk has been advocating. And it would also potentially limit the use of brain chips as a way to avoid being outmoded by AI in the workforce. Okay, uh, so there's a lot at stake here. Um, and also, I think it's only going to get worse in terms of the urgency of the issue, given the uh, increasing sophistication of AI chatbots. They, uh, you know, they tug at the heartstrings, as do humanoid androids. I have Sophia in my lab right now, uh, a humanoid. And, you know, the public has this tendency to be sympathetic to something that acts or looks biological. Um, and I also think the issue is important for reasons of pure philosophical gratification. Um, so does consciousness transcend the brain? This is an issue we could figure out if we could actually test for AI consciousness. We could learn more about the issue. Um, furthermore, we could uh, inquire into the issue of the range of minded beings. And we could illuminate the question, could consciousness be extended with external chips? You see, so we're learning something about the extended mind approach, and in particular, the very controversial view that consciousness could be extended. All right, um, there's also ways that it can illuminate the control problem. Uh, if something's conscious, will it have more sympathy for lower beings because it understands that those beings have the felt quality of experience? Or on the other hand, would it make the system more volatile? The military has been very worried about this. So think of a teenager in the throes of hormones. All right, um, in my project with NASA, uh, you know, as the NASA chair, um, I worked on the evolution of intelligence throughout the universe. And I'll just say that for life that is capable of surviving its technological maturity, if there's any out there, big question. Um, there's an issue of whether the most intelligent entities would actually become post-biological um, or even if they might be artificial intelligences. And I think it's important for us to learn more about whether AI is conscious to know if these entities would be conscious. Okay, um, so the upshot is that the import of AI consciousness goes well beyond robo rights issues. Now, how do we test given the import? Oh boy, I mean, there are immense difficulties here. I mean, no neuroanatomy in AI, no biology. 
um, you know, consciousness in biological systems evolved through Darwinian evolution and all instances of life on earth, they're connected. We only have one case of life, it's all related. Um, AI in contrast uh, is a form, I mean, it's evolved through what we might call intelligent design, so to speak, uh, human designers, not you know, a, a grand creator, uh, like a god. Um, and I'm talking about designers at places like Google and Facebook. Um, the evolutionary constraints in this context are things like AI regulations, how and whether it's regulated, economic profit incentives, the speed of computation, fiber optic cables, 5G, all of these business and technical elements uh, that just don't even arise in the context of Darwinian theories. Okay, further, <laughs> I'm gonna get through this and I'm gonna get to the test. There's an N equals one problem. So this is a problem uh, that astrobiologists talk about. Um, in the context of astrobiology, the problem is that in seeking life in the universe, we only have one known case of it, us. Uh, and if we generalize from it, we may actually miss life elsewhere because we could be outliers. The search for consciousness in at least the case of alien life and AI may very well have that same sort of problem. If we use the human case as a model, even in a, in a theory light approach, for example, we could miss the phenomena of consciousness altogether. But on the other hand, and again, I'm just raising challenges here. I'm not saying I can surmount them. We only have, you know, the cases on earth to begin with. So where else do we go as a beginning point? But it's just something that should keep us humble. We also have uh, what I call the system demarcation problem with respect to AI consciousness. So I'm writing a book on these issues now. So, you know, I'm arguing that the most intelligent AIs will actually be uh, global brain systems. They will be coordinated cloud-based systems consisting in AI services with linked together by underground components at like the NSA or you know, organized by the Chinese government, um, not fully accessible to the public. So the question here is, how do you identify something as a highly intelligent AI system so that it can even be tested when you don't, you can't demarcate the boundaries of the system? Also, um, various systems could share the same part, say they share Wiki, for example, or Facebook content. There's also the well-known black box or interpretability issue with deep learning systems. And then there's the, what I call the recursive self-improving algorithm problem, which is you know, the, something that is discussed uh, in Bostrom's book on superintelligence, that superintelligent machines would uh, constantly and rapidly self-improve. It puts us in a position of needing to test and retest constantly for machine consciousness. Okay, uh, um, we have our hands full with this. Boy, so what are we going to do? Well, look, I'm going to venture some tests, but remember, safety tests can go wrong. Uh, you know, that's from the film iRobot. Okay, so let's start first with uh, a very admittedly anthropomorphic test that, you know, isn't listening to the small n issue, the n equals one issue. Um, so this is presented, though, as a sufficient condition. All right, so notice that one of the most compelling, though not always recognized indications that normally functioning humans experience consciousness is that nearly every adult can quickly and readily grasp notions based on the felt quality of consciousness. So to give you some examples, ideas include scenarios like mind switching bodies, as in the film Freaky Friday, life after death, including the idea of reincarnation, the hard problem, although some philosophers insist they don't get that, I, sometimes I don't believe them though, um, or minds leaving their bodies like astral projection. Um, now, whether or not such scenarios have any reality to them, like you can be as skeptical as you want. My point here is just that it would be difficult to comprehend these situations if you're an entity that had no consciousness whatsoever. It would be like expecting a creature who lacks auditory abilities to fully experience the sound 
of a Bach concerto, for example. All this said, this is just background for the test. The ACT test or the AI consciousness test is a Q&A test probing for the felt quality of experience in AI along these lines. And this is something that I owe to my collaborator as well, Edwin Turner. We were both professors at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton together. Uh, he's now at Princeton in astrophysics and he's a student of Marvin Minsky. So he was kind of doing this on the side. So thank you, Ed, for working with us on this. Um, so here's some sample questions. I'll let you look at them. I'll give you a second, I'll drink some coffee. A whole bunch of these questions are on page 55 of my book, Artificial You. I'll explain number three in a sec. That was Ed's idea. And the point isn't, oh, is the machine a materialist? I mean, even if it is, <laughs> the point is we want to see if the machine gets it, if they get the questions and they answer intelligently, because, you know, obviously lots of materialists are conscious. Now, why number three? What's that have to do with? Well, that was a point Ed made about time symmetry in physics, time being symmetrical, and that only conscious beings would have a firm preference for not having suffering or loss of consciousness in the future as opposed to the past. That's that's interesting that conscious beings are always looking to the future. Okay, so that gives you an idea of what this test is. And you might be thinking it's just another Turing test. And this sort of drives me crazy. The media, when they report on this, they suggest that. But Yes, it's a Q&A test based on behavior, but uh, unlike the Turing test, we're actually uh, looking at what's transpiring inside the machine to look at mindedness, um, to reveal a subtle and elusive property of the machine's mind. Also, a machine could fail the Turing test because it's not convincingly human, but pass the ACT test because it exhibits behavioral indications of consciousness. All right, objections. Oh, you know, lots of them here. So you're probably thinking of maybe like the Android Sophia, who is programmed to act like she's conscious and, you know, she breaks a lot. Uh, and everybody can tell that that would be a bad case. Like, you don't want to give tests like that to scripted programs. So you have to choose your careful, you have to choose your candidates carefully. More seriously, uh, what just happened with Lambda, uh, you know, where Blake Lemoyne, an engineer who was actually developing the system, started to believe that it was conscious, I took very seriously. And you might wonder, would Lambda pass? And a lot of reporters were calling me. And I said, no, years ago when I wrote, when you know, I wrote about this test. I specifically said that if you test a deep learning system, it can't be a system that has information in its database already from places like Wikipedia um, that talk about machine mindedness or human consciousness, neurophysiology and whatnot, because it will generate responses based on crawling that material. So how do we make the test useful then? given the uh, widespread nature of deep learning systems. I mean, they always, you know, these chatbots will always be exposed to, you know, billions of words and websites. Well, I said back then that you have to box in the AI at the R&D stage. You have to deny it access to the internet and indeed prohibit it from gaining any knowledge of the world and especially information about consciousness experience, emotion, and neuroscience. So, you know, you might think, well, that's a lot to do. Well, you know, these AI developers do box in their systems. They don't just unleash them. So this is something that can be done at the R&D stage if you're dealing with the natural language system. All right, so what are the advantages of the act? And again, it's just a sufficient condition. Well, it doesn't require looking into the black box. 
Uh, so it gets around interpretability problems um, as well as as long as you run it often uh, when you're developing a super intelligence, if it has self-improving algorithms and you keep running the act, you know, to a certain degree, you might still be able to use the test. Also, it doesn't require a verdict on the neural basis of consciousness in humans or consciousness in non-human animals. There are a lot of disadvantages. Um, look, it's limited uh, to boxed in linguistic AIs that have a kind of self-concept, all right? I do happen to think that any AI that we run it on will have a primitive self-concept and I'll explain that if anybody wants later. Uh, but here's another test. So years ago, I devised what I call the chip test. Um, and what I think I'll do here, because I'm going to run out of time, is just quickly read you, um, you know, a passage or like, you know, maybe a page or two to just lay out the chip test. I think that's the best way to do it. Recall that silicon-based brain chips are already under development as a treatment for various memory-related conditions such as Alzheimer's and PTSD. And companies like Google, excuse me, Kernel and Neuralink aim to develop AI-based brain enhancements for healthy individuals. In a similar vein, suppose that, and here I'm going back to an earlier thought experiment in the book, over at the hypothetical firm iBrain, which we are imagining in this scenario uh, still exists, uh, researchers are trying to create chips that are functional isomorphs of parts of the brain, um, such as areas of the brain like the colostrum, say. They will generally replace parts of your brain with brand new durable microchips. As before, you are to stay awake during the surgery and report any changes to the felt quality of your experience. The, the scientists are keen to learn whether any aspect of your consciousness is impaired. Their hope is to perfect neural prosthetics in areas of the brain underlying consciousness. If during this process, a prosthetic part of the brain ceases to function normally, specifically if it ceases to give rise to the aspect of consciousness that the brain area is responsible for, then there should be outward indications, including verbal reports. An otherwise normal person should be able to detect or at least indicate to others through odd behaviors that something is amiss, as with traumatic brain injuries involving loss of consciousness in some domain. If this did happen, it would indicate a substitution failure of the artificial part for the original component, and the scientists conducting the experiment could conclude microchips of that sort just don't seem to be the right stuff. This procedure could serve as a means for determining whether a chip made of a certain substrate and architecture, chip architecture, can underwrite consciousness, at least when it's placed in a larger system we already believe to be conscious. Either failure or success could inform us about whether AI can be conscious. Consider the implications of a negative result. A single substitution failure is unpersuasive. How could observers tell that the underlying cause is that silicon, say, is an unsuitable substrate? Why not instead conclude the chip designers failed to add a key feature to the prototype chip, a problem they eventually fix over time? But after years of trying and failing, scientists may reasonably question whether that kind of chip is a suitable substi substitute when it comes to consciousness. Further, if science makes similar attempts with all other feasible substrates and chip designs, a global failure would be a sign for all intents and purposes, conscious AI isn't possible on Earth or within our technological capacities. I get, I'm not going to go into the modal claims here, but I think what I want to say is within our tech, our current technological abilities and in the near future as well. We may still regard conscious AI as conceivable, but from a practical standpoint, from the vantage point of our technological abilities, it's not possible. It may not even be compatible with the laws of nature to build consciousness in a different substrate. One more paragraph. 
In contrast, what if a certain kind of microchip works? In this case, we have reason to believe that this kind of chip is the right stuff. Although it's important to bear in mind that our conclusion pertains to the specific microchip only, that type. Furthermore, even if a type of chip works in humans, there is still the issue of whether the AI in question has the right cognitive architecture for consciousness. We should not simply assume, even if chips work in humans, that all AIs that are built with those chips are conscious. Well, what's the value of the test then? Well, if a type of chip passes when it's embedded in a biological system, this should alert us to the very real possibility um, that AIs that have these chips could be conscious. So it's a marker and a marker for consciousness. Um, other tests for machine consciousness could then be applied, such as the ACT, um, at least if the appropriate conditions for the use of those tests are met. Further, if it turns out that only one kind of chip passes the test, it could be that chips of this type are necessary for machine consciousness. So here we would have a necessary condition. Um, okay, so, you know, there's also a dialogue going on uh, between different kinds of tests. Um, so, for example, the chip test can suggest cases that an act could miss. For instance, perhaps a non-linguistic, highly sensory-based consciousness like that of a non-human animal could be built from chips that pass the chip test. Yet the AI may nevertheless lack the intellectual sophistication or linguistic ability to pass the act. And we could also utilize Tononi's IIT, uh, you know, to run tests on chips. Um, anyway, so that gives you a sense of the chip test. And I want to conclude now looking forward. Um, you can tell that this is at a very early phase, but dialogue on the issue is very important. If you have any suggestions, please don't hesitate to email me. Um, I also have ideas about what I call a reverse chip test years in the future. Um, that would involve a system that's a simulated human brain or animal brain. You could do it at the animal level, non-human animal level, with an integrated biological component. Uh, you could determine what biological component to use, if any, when added could give rise to consciousness. Um, and you could run ACT on it, perhaps, if we're talking about linguistic cases to see. This could teach us about the biological basis of consciousness in humans. Where is the spark? Uh, if you add some biological components to the um, hybrid biological computer system, would it have the spark of consciousness then? I'm talking about um, hybrid systems here, animats. They're often called animats. Um, and you could also use it to see if and where an AI falls short. Okay, um, perhaps future AIs will inform us about consciousness in AI as well, um, helping us discover what we've missed. All right, thank you. <laughs> A lot Great, to thank you. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you uh, both uh, Jonathan and Susan for those talks, that was great. And we have a lot of questions rolling in and about 35 minutes or so left. So I will only ask a quick question to start the conversation and then we can go directly to audience questions. And actually this quick question will itself include an audience question. So, so I basically wanted to invite each of you to offer any response that you might want to offer to the other. If, if you have any questions or comments based on the other's talk, please feel free to ask it. And, and then I also wanted to ask you for your current thoughts, which of course might be updated by the end of the conversation about whether it makes sense to bring these conversations together. To what degree might it make sense to seek a unified test or investigation for consciousness across biological and artificial systems, as opposed to pursuing separate frameworks for biological and artificial systems. Uh, so so uh, Susan, maybe I can start with you and, and invite you to react to Jonathan's talk and or address that question about uh, integrating the conversation. Jonathan, that was really interesting. So I would be keen on learning more, thinking more about it, especially for the case of highly neuromorphic AIs. So if you have an AI, for example, that's supposed to be designed like the human brain, as, as AI gets more and more sophisticated, I would wonder 
wow, would you see uh, the kind of effects that you're looking for involving, say, trace conditioning, right? Um, but because of the range of AIs, we have to think of uh, non-brain-like AIs. I mean, for example, I'm actually somewhat skeptical that most of the very sophisticated AIs we'll see in the future will be brain-like. Um, so if you look at, say, Lambda, it's not very brain-like. I mean, it's associative the way, you know, the brain can be associative too, but, you know, other than that, um, but I think that these systems do have a vast capacity, um, you know, and I, I think AI companies, I talk about this in my book, will cheap out on consciousness. If they can get they can string together miscellaneous AI services without trying to build something that's precisely brain-like, they'll do it because they just want to make money. Um, so your proposal uh, is that conscious, if, if I understood it, right, consciousness linked abilities in the biological case um, are something you want to look at in the case of very simple creatures as well. Um, and I don't know if in the case of AI, the same cognitive capacities will be linked to consciousness, if that makes sense. So you can imagine, I mean, like in the human case, I'll, I'll use the human case, and I know you didn't really like the global workspace case, but you know, what if there are a lot of AI projects trying to build global workspaces right now? Okay. But I get this feeling that the these, the way they're doing it is so rough. It's just a very coarse grained approach and consciousness may not actually come in for the ride because all we really want is some very basic replication of the human case. So I don't know. Um, I'll stop there though to give you time. So. No, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for those comments. I, I think you're absolutely right that the, the theory light strategy I was describing has background assumptions. I think that the big background assumption is that conscious perception is this evolved phenomenon in a brain that is, uh, has in, is it in some sense evolved to overlay earlier, more ancient forms of unconscious sensory processing. And so we've got a contrast there. We can look for the functional contrast between what the conscious pathways do and what the non-conscious sensory pathways do. Um, now, as you say, the best case for those background assumptions being satisfied in AI is something like a whole brain emulation of an animal brain. And then maybe you could do the same tests. And if you see the same facilitative profile, that might give you some reason to believe you have uh, emulated the relevant mechanisms that are involved in consciousness. Um, but as you say, most AI, and particularly the most commercially lucrative forms of AI, does not work like that at all, which gives us a real challenge of what other tests are we going to use to try and um, settle questions about those systems? Yeah, no, in a way that leads naturally into sort of comments on, on your talk, Susan. I mean, should we, do you want to go to that, Jeff? Yeah, sure. Go for it. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking and listening to the, the talk, I'm, I think I'm more pessimistic than you in some ways, Susan, but also more optimistic in, in another way, because you, you talk about the N equals one problem. And I think I'm more optimistic in that I, think there probably isn't an n equals one problem when it comes to consciousness because i suspect that we have multiple evolved instances out there in the biological world that have evolved separately just as vision has evolved about uh 40 times something like that um i think consciousness may have evolved over and over again and that's great i mean to me that is an opening for a strategy that involves trying to find as many instances as we can in the biological world to see what they have in common and to try and find the deep computational features that they have in common, which may break us out of that N equals one problem and lead us to some really good markers um, to look for. So that's the point where I'm more optimistic. And then where I'm more pessimistic is with the, the, t the two tests you described where the sort of boxing you were describing I strongly suspect is, is, is not really feasible because if you think of something like a large language model, 1.5 trillion words of training data, you need the training data to get the intelligent performance out, but that training data is saturated with reference to human consciousness, feeling, experience, all the things we, we accept as being believable. Um, and so that, that's all 
I mean, that's how Lambda ends up generating its um, impressive performance and GPT-3, et cetera. So you take, if you stripping, selectively stripping the training data of references to feeling, emotion, et cetera, I just uh, don't think is feasible. And so a, a test that relies on us being able to do that, I'm quite skeptical of it really working. Great. Um, Susan, would you like to briefly respond to that point and then we can turn to audience questions? Super brief, yeah. Um, AI companies have loads of money. They can strip it. <laughs> they can. I mean, come on. But but um, I also think, you know, there are lots of different kinds of systems we can use the test on as well. Um, but to go back to the N equals one thing, I mean, yeah, so in the biologic, in the case of astrobiology, the point was that there's only one case of life. All life here is interrelated which is amazing to think about, right? And similarly, I'm not saying there's only one case of consciousness, obviously, but all instances of consciousness, short of conscious machines, if they're, they're out there, are related on the tree of life. And that is still somewhat restricted. Mm. That's what I'm saying. But this is what I'm challenging, that I don't think all the instances are homologous, because I think that... Um... Octopuses may well be conscious and arthropods, and I don't think the last common ancestor of humans, arthropods and cephalopods was conscious. I mean, it's hard to be sure, right? But, but I think it's unlikely. So I think we may be looking at convergent evolution, separate pathways, independent of each other. And that puts us, that's a good epistemic situation to be in, right? Because we can look for the common features that convergently evolve over and over again. It's a fair fairly good position to be in, but I'm, I'm, we're talking past each other because the different cases of evolution, say with eyes, right, and with consciousness, I, I believe too that octopus is conscious, came from the same instance of life originally. That's all. They had, they had a living common ancestor, that seems correct, yeah, but I suspect the common ancestor was not conscious. I'm not I, saying... I, I <laughs> I imagine we, we can go back and forth on this one point for the next 25 minutes. Yeah. So I was saying microbes were conscious. Yeah. It's quite tempting to do so actually, yes. But oh, no, um but we have right, but that's not what I'm okay. <laughs> Should we go to the, the audience? Yeah, we, then, Jeff? we we have we have about 25 minutes and we have 21 questions, and I expect more will be coming in. So we will of course not get to so all the questions. One minute answers. Yes, please, please do aspire to keep answers brief. And to audience members, FYI, we will be sharing all of the questions and comments with the speakers after the fact in case any are not asked during the session itself. So we can start with a couple of questions from uh, our co-hosts at the Center for Mind, Brain and Consciousness. One is a question from Ned Block directed at Susan. Uh, and this is the question, Susan, doesn't success in the chip test just show that the chip duplicates the input output relation of the biological part that it replaces, that is neurons? But what if it processes, sorry, but what if processes inside neurons are crucial to consciousness? The CHEP test would give us the wrong result if this is true. How would it give us the wrong result? So I think the thought is that uh, it would be duplicating the input output, the functional uh, work that neurons do, but not the internal processes of the neurons themselves. And, and if the, the hypothesis is that something internal to the neurons themselves is what generates consciousness or is what is essential to consciousness. In that scenario, on that hypothesis, the CHIPS test would give us the wrong result, I think is the point. I'm not sure it would give us the wrong result. I mean, is the idea somehow that the phenomenal feel is separable from its causal role? Is that the idea? Because yeah, that it, that it would be that, that it would be separable yeah. from uh, or, or go beyond the functional role that the neurons uh, play in, in generating output behaviors. Well, I, I guess it goes to some issues involving property natures, for example, issues about whether you can separate the causal role from the phenomenal feel. And I actually am, you know, I, I'm a dispositionalist and I won't go into my particular view of property natures, but I mean, I don't believe that there will be a situation where we create a chip that's a causal isomorph of what a neuron does but it lacks the phenomenal feel because I think categoricity and dispositionality are actually two sides of the same coin. So I have a sort of 
two-sided view of property nature. So you could just parse that as a dispositionalist approach. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And then we also have a question from uh, David Chalmers for Jonathan. Uh, question for Jonathan. Consciousness seems to facilitate many things in humans. Your strategy could use this to support consciousness in all sorts of organisms. For example, plausibly consciousness facilitates danger avoidance and a related cluster of behaviors in humans. Could one use that to argue that systems that facilitate this cluster of behaviors in paramecia involve consciousness? If not, how do we distinguish the sorts of facilitation that count? The general worry is that there are clusters of cognitive capacities at all levels from very simple to very complex that consciousness seems to facilitate. Mm. Yeah, I'm very open to the idea that some of the things consciousness facilitates in us are really very simple. Um, I think of trace conditioning as being in that category. It's a surprisingly simple thing to be facilitated by consciousness. And then the proposal is not just that we go and look for those abilities that in us are facilitated, but that we go and look for similar patterns of facilitation. So the, the Drosophila work illustrates this, I think, that we're not just looking for trace conditioning in Drosophila, but for a dissociation that parallels what we see in humans, where there's a pathway that handles the trace conditioning uh, and facilitates it, and another pathway that does delay conditioning and is absolutely fine by itself. And then the, the thought is that we can look for patterns of facilitation across a range of cognitive abilities in search of this special pathway that is facilitating very much the same things as the conscious perceptual pathway facilitates in us. So the thought is that, you know, it's very unlikely really that you'd find um, the pattern of facilitation in a paramecium. Um, and, and some would say implausible, you'd even find it in Drosophila. But I think it may not be as implausible as we as we think to find that, to find a substantially similar mechanism with a substantially similar facilitative profile in Drosophila. And that if we did find that, it would be to me, you know, as compelling as a, as a functional case could ever get for, for consciousness in that animal. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, so we will now go to a question from Michael Solomon. And this question was originally written to you, Jonathan, uh, but, but either of you can reply to it. Uh, why limit the work even to, this is my expansion of the question, why limit the work even to arthropods and uh, artificial intelligences. What about plants? What do you what do you expect that your test would would tell us about uh, plants? And and Michael cites the work of Susan Simard, uh, who authored Finding the Mother Tree. Um, so do you have any thoughts about about yeah. plants? If I'm I mean, if I'm brutally honest, I don't think plants perceive. And so I think the idea of a dissociation between conscious and unconscious perception in plants um is a non-starter i mean if, if there's no perception there's no hmm. conscious perception that, that so, seems a little bit surprising to me just in the sense that plants well do perceive in a wide sense of taking in sensory information and processing that information i agree there's, and I agree there's a debate there right mm -hmm. i agree there's a debate there because plants do register they mm -hmm. register the world around them i'm thinking perhaps of tyler burge's work on the, the idea that there's a distinction between merely sensory registering something and perceiving it. Yeah, so I think mm. of myself as quite a skeptic about um, there being conscious perception in plants. Now, that's, um, it's it's an a posteriori question, it's an empirical question, so I'm quite happy to be convinced by high quality evidence, but I've never seen any evidence that has shifted my probabilities uh, upwards. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Susan, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, cases like that in the slime mold indicate to me that we need to appreciate that intelligence and consciousness can come apart. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Oh yeah, I agree about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Anna uh, Donch writes a question for Jonathan. What might the public policy implications of research into animal sentience be? Could scientific findings have a material concrete impact on agriculture policies, fishing policies, animal abuse laws, environmental protection regulations, et cetera. This might be a good opportunity mm -hmm. to talk a little bit about your policy work. And Susan, we, we can pose the same mm -hmm. question to you on the AI front. Yeah, great. Absolutely. There's this policy facing side to my project, which is absolutely about saying, let's not just have a science of animal sentience. Let's put that 
science to work from the beginning to design better policies, laws, and ways of caring for animals. And the receptiveness to that side of the project, um, particularly in the UK, has been way above my expectations in that policymakers were, were genuinely vexed by this question of whether animal welfare law should protect cephalopods and, and decapods in particular. And um, at least in this one piece of legislation this year, they, they, took, they took our advice. They commissioned scientific advice from a panel of experts across disciplines that, that I led. And um, they took the advice. And for me, that was a heartening thing to see because to me, that's, that's a good way to formulate policy, to, to commission advice and to listen to the advice. And so I absolutely hope that will be the case going forward and that there'll be lots of opportunities for high quality research into animal sentience, even though inconclusive, you know, even though it's about managing and communicating uncertainty rather than achieving certainty, can still provide a better evidence base for policy. And, it, and in some countries, at least, including my own, it does seem like policymakers uh, care about that. Susan, do you have uh, anything you want to add on the AI front? Real quick. Oh, <laughs> well, I work with Congress. I mean, I presented the contents of my book to Congress in the Capitol building. Uh, you know, I give talks there. In fact, we're planning more events. Um, and, um, you know, there's lots of issues here. I guess to prioritize worries, I mean, at the Lambda thing really called to my attention the inevitability of AIs that will try to impersonate human-like qualities, and I think it will be very important for us to articulate to the public whether they're conscious or at least the uncertainty surrounding consciousness. I mean, humans will start to marry them. I'm sure some of you saw the film Her. Um, and also, there is an attitude, a sort of what I'll call a transhumanist attitude that is probably inspired a lot by Elon Musk, that is that the replacement of the biological brain by AI components or the replacement even of the entire species by AI uh, would be great or at least maybe not obviously harmful because we would be replacing ourselves with something more durable and more intellectually capable. <laughs> and it's like, come on people, think about machine consciousness here. Again, go back to the chip test and you know, think about whether we can even be confident that those replacement entities will be capable of consciousness. And so what we have to do, and I'm excited about your center, is try to articulate these issues clearly and without getting mired in philosophical details <laughs> and really go out there and get the word out so that there's some kind of conceptual clarity because shit's going to hit the fan. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, yes. that's a good way of it's a good way of putting it. Yeah, I, I I agree that there's this huge societal problem coming down the road fast. That large right. language models are persuading experts occasionally, like in the Blake Lemoyne case, of their sentience, and we can mm -hmm. expect them to be persuading non-experts in large numbers very soon, particularly when they're in VR environments with human faces. And that's that's a huge problem for society to confront. And I think the tech companies are seeing this now. They see they need to be able to give clear answers to the question, why is this thing not sentient? And uh, it's a problem for them that it, it's hard to give those answers right now. They don't. Great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, let me now ask uh, a question specifically to Susan and then one specifically to Jonathan. Uh, so Susan, this question is from uh, Eddie Namias. Susan, can you remind us what you say about how to test for consciousness in creatures like animals without language? Uh, I would bet on consciousness in creatures with bodies and no language over creatures with language and no bodies. I would bet unconsciousness in bet on consciousness. So in other words, he thinks consciousness. consciousness is more likely if it you got a body but no language than if you oh. have language but no body. Oh, Eddie, yeah. I mean, I too, like if I was going to bet, um, I think though that we need to be very careful about intuitions. And also just because we're more confident, like I'm extremely confident with cases like the octopus, for example, uh, does not mean that we shouldn't be very concerned about the case of machine consciousness. I mean, a lot of us sort of 
you know, off the cuff would say, oh, Lambda isn't conscious, come on, right? I mean, we all did this when the issue came up. I'm speaking, we like AI experts or philosophers, like I know David Chalmers is here. I'm sure he did the same thing. I did it, you know, but we need to be very careful to explore methodological um, assumptions and venture tests for machine consciousness so that we don't just rely on intuitions. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, thank you. Okay, so Jonathan, the question for you is from Aaron Wilson. How should we balance the precautionary principle with competing practical and moral interests? Should we assign the interests of creatures that might be conscious the same general weight that we assign the uh, creatures who are more likely to be conscious or less weight than creatures who are less likely to be conscious? Uh, and, and I'll add that this relates to a discussion that uh, both of us have participated in about whether we should contrast the precautionary principle with a kind of expected value principle, right? Where a precautionary principle would say, if they might be conscious, treat them like they are conscious, whereas an expected value principle would have you discount the interest based on probability of consciousness. So you can get more weight for beings who are more likely to be conscious and less weight for mm -hmm. beings who are less likely to be conscious. And, and I wonder if you have any thoughts about the pros and cons of the precautionary principle that just says, yeah, when in doubt, treat them as conscious versus the expected value principle that says discount based on probability of consciousness. Yeah, no, thanks for the question. I, I have a, a book in progress about these issues called The Edge of Sentience that is, it's too soon to advertise, but it will, will be coming out eventually. I, I am genuinely quite skeptical of the expected value approach you were describing because of the problem of interspecies comparisons and just the thought that, that the weights we give in these calculations are arbitrary and they reflect the the preferences of the powerful people who decide what the weights are and so i've been looking for different approaches and i think precautionary frameworks can be different approaches at the same time there needs to be this concept of proportionality at the, at the heart of it where it's not that you know no action is too drastic to protect a single insect you know it's not let's ban driving because a single insect might get hurt there has to be discussion about what kind of measures are proportionate to what sort of risks. And we have to do this in a way that um, I think is appropriately democratic and that brings in stakeholders from across society who are going to be affected by the policies we choose, but also people who can represent the interests of the animals whose, whose interests are also at stake. I think it's very hard to do. It's very hard to construct democratic processes that command confidence. But I think let's start thinking about it now, because as I say, the animal problem has always been with us, I suppose, but there's now this huge new problem coming down the road at us in relation to AI as well. We need to be start starting to think about how in a democratic society, we address these questions of proportionality. And it's never too soon to start doing that. Great, thank you. Uh, so I now have a, a question for both of you, and then hopefully there'll be time for, for a question for each of you again. So this question is from Mal Graham, uh, and, and it relates once again to this question, whether we should be seeking to integrate approaches to examining, uh, investigating, looking for consciousness in, in biological and artificial systems. So Mal asks, if questions about animal consciousness will be most easily addressed by analogy with human biology and potentially evolutionary history, does the fact that AI don't share our biology or evolution with animals imply that these two sciences, AI and animal consciousness, will not generally have overlapping results or, or even, I might add, overlapping methods. Yeah, who are you putting that one to? Uh, either, either or both. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I think there needs to be an integrated approach to human, animal consciousness and AI consciousness. As I say, I think we're currently in a situation where we do not have good markers for when an AI is is conscious. I'm a little bit more pessimistic than, than Susan on that, I think. I'm, I'm really worried about the ability of, of AI to game all the criteria we come up with in the way that Lambda games the traditional Tur Turing test. Um, I think that the solution comes through looking for deep computational architectural markers that the AI cannot game. You know, that when we find them, we know they're really there. And um, we don't currently know what those markers are. There's various proposals we might have about the deep computational features. 
but our current situation is one of great ignorance. And for me, the path to remedying that ignorance is through a program of animal consciousness research of the type I was describing that looks for as many independently evolved instances as we can find and looks for the deep computational features that we find recurring wherever consciousness evolves. So to me, the program has to be a, an integrated one. Researchers with an interest in animal and AI consciousness have to be working together. Great, thank you. Um, Susan, is there anything that you'd like to add? Um, I'm all for working together and it's too early to tell. Um, mm -hmm. Consciousness could be something like a cluster concept and you know, um, we just won't know until, uh, you know, we have an actual science. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so we now have a question from Mattias Mikkel. Uh, to make stimuli unconscious, Jonathan, I believe this is for you. Uh, to make mm -hmm. stimuli unconscious, we have to weaken the stimuli, for instance, by masking the stimuli. This creates a confound. When we find that consciousness facilitates a function, Perhaps the function is instead trivially facilitated by strong stimuli or strong signals, not by the fact that yeah. it is conscious. So is there a way of dealing with this problem with the theory light approach? I'm smiling because it's the classic Matthias Michel question, <laughs> talking about this for years. Right? But um, look, I think it would be fantastic to, to have really good ways of control, controlling for the confound of, of signal strength. It's a genuine problem. I mean, to illustrate the problem, when you present a stimulus subliminally, you weaken it. So if you think of those cues with the monkeys, you, you to make it subliminal, you weaken it, and then you've got two differences between the two conditions. I mean, there's, there's putatively whether it's consciously perceived or not, but also how strong the signal was to begin with. And this is what Matthias is, is worried about. Now, yes, we need good ways to control for that. At the same time, I think, you know, if one finds a systematic pattern of facilitation across multiple cognitive abilities with a threshold effect. So it's very, very much seems to be the case that when the information reaches this very special mechanism, then the abilities are, are all facilitated. And if it doesn't get through the gates, none of these abilities are facilitated. I really think it, it, the best explanation starts to look like, you know, the difference was made by the fact the stimulus was consciously perceived and not by the difference in signal strength. With signal strength, I don't think we expect to see, we would expect to see threshold effects at the same point across a whole range of different abilities. So in principle, I mean, that's my reason for thinking this, the confound that Matthias is talking about is not completely fatal to the sort of research program that people I'm talking about have been, have been pursuing. But nonetheless, it would be great to have better methods in which that confound never arises at all. Great, thank you. And uh, we now have a question for Susan from Francois Kammerer. And this might be the last one we have time for, but we can see. Uh, so against the ACT test, isn't it the case that any system representing that it enters non-physical, primitive, immediately known and ineffable states, maybe with a couple of other specifications, will have the right intuitions and get the same problems? Uh, admit that there is a hard problem, envision astral projections, et cetera, even if by hypothesis, they are not at all conscious. Uh, in contrast, experiencing a symphony by Beethoven gives us the ability to make an extremely rich set of reports. In other words, isn't it a problem for the idea of the ACT test that our intuition specifically about consciousness seem to be capturable by a couple of generic principles? Um, consciousness is non-physical, primitive, immediately known, inevitable, something like that. Um, so, so that, that was a, a long question, but, but, uh, does that make sense? Do you want to respond to that? Yeah. Thank you mm -hmm. for the question. Um, I actually think it's not the case that a machine can easily fake out, uh, answers to a cleverly designed act test, but in any case, these, um, candidates can't be exposed to that kind of information. So they're by definition, not to be the sort of systems that have already had those principles uh, in their data set or in the larger program. Okay, great, thank you. We actually do have time for at least one more question now. Uh, so I'm going to go to a question from uh, Derek Huang and uh, re rephrase it a little bit and, and pose it to both of you. 
Uh, so chat GPT, uh, can, you, can you please give me an estimate of the probability of consciousness for chat uh, GPT out of out of a hundred, how how likely is this chatbot to be conscious in your in your view? Go, uh, Jonathan first. <laughs> oh wow, um, zero point zero one uh, between zero and that. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so so non-zero, but very very low uh, on the borderline of negligible. Uh, Susan, yeah. what do you think? If it's micro conscious, because I'm. Mm -hmm. sort of at Pam proto psychist these days. Mm -hmm. uh, so then I give it, you know, I give it consciousness in that micro conscious sense. But I suppose we all want to know about the what I think is the interesting sort of consciousness, what we might call macro consciousness, and you know whether it's minded in a real, you know, uh, important goal oriented, um, phenomenal state sense and there I it's hard but I mean I would say two percent but that's just again based on intuition wow awesome okay two percent you heard it here first from Susan Schneider uh that, the that main is thing is the average is going down if you add ours to David Chalmers one from a few weeks ago <laughs> the average is going down <laughs> yeah if we if we aggregate the experts, yeah, we, we have something yeah. between 0.01 and 10%, which is perhaps enough for moral significance right now today, according to the precautionary principle and the expected value principle uh, for whatever that might be worth. Uh, okay, well, I think I think that is the last question we should ask if we want to end on time. So, so I will uh, just now conclude by first of all, thanking both of you. They were great talks and a really, really interesting discussion. And I was really glad we were able to put these discussions together. And I think it would be great to continue doing that and, and to thank everybody for being here. This is such a busy time in the semester. And so I'm really grateful that everybody took time out of, out of your day to join us for the conversation. Uh, and, and just a reminder, that the Mind Ethics and Policy program will regularly be hosting public online talks like this. So if you want to stay tuned for future talks in this series, uh, please go to our website. You can find it from the NYU webpage and you can sign up for our events list uh, and feel free to be in touch with us uh, personally. If you have interest in these issues, I would be happy to hear from you and talk with you. Uh, and just thank you again to Sophia for organizing this. Thank you again to our co-sponsors, the Center for Mind, Brain, and Consciousness, NYU Animal Studies, and uh, the NYU Center for Bioethics. And finally, thank you again, especially to Susan and Jonathan for joining us for these great talks. We really appreciate it. Thank you. That was really cool. I yeah, it was really cool. <laughs> thank you, Jeff. Okay. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks again. Thanks, everyone.